and uh, letting people get here. So, uh, so thanks for being on time. I'm sure some more people will arrive soon. But uh, we've just had a good talk uh, this morning which has uh, told us that we're in a war and that uh, we have to make sure that all our information stays out there and stays free. I guess once you have all that free information, it wants to form its own social networks. We need ways of uh, sorting it out, letting it uh, join groups with uh, other like-minded information. I think Paul's going to give us a way of uh, trying to classify that information and, uh, and, and sort it and store it and things like that. So I'd like to ask you all to welcome Paul Harvey. Hello. Yes, well, uh, this, this talk is a, a little bit of an exaggeration. It was just to get you here. Um, accidental wealth is really, when I'm talking about accidental wealth, it's really trying to create workflows that are useful in everyday work, and we accidentally, or at least um, without any extra effort by the user, they've, they've come up with a workflow and a system that allows them to collate and uh, and store their information in reusable ways. So where I work at the Centre for Plant Biodiversity Research, um, researchers are often geneticists, um, taxonomists, natural life science people, and although the young ones these days do have very good computing skills, um, there's been a long tradition of really overusing Microsoft Excel. I just have to say it. That, um, there are way too many Excel spreadsheets out there. A lot of copy-paste madness um, and a lot of time wasted um, trying to merge data, check data. Um, so we've been trying to leverage FOSWiki. Has anybody heard of FOSWiki before before this talk? Oh, good. That's, that's excellent. How about TWiki? Yep, a few more. Um, well, FOSWiki is written in Perl. Although Olo disagrees with that, it says it's written in JavaScript, but you know we check in a lot of jQuery libraries and things like that. It also said it's worth nearly $51 million, but that's a very interesting claim. Um, at two years and uh, three months old, we've come quite a long way. We've had over 10,000 check-ins, nearly 400 a month. There's um, anywhere between 10 and 22 uh, contributors every month. And I managed to abuse Olo to make a very flattering graph here where FOSWiki is coming out on top above of, above of um, Drupal and Semantic Media Wiki. Of course, that's a bit of a lie. That's just the core. So if we count contributions, yeah, FOSWiki is down the bottom there. So it's not a huge project, but it is, it is still significant in, in my opinion. Um, Drupal completely dwarfs everything, as you can see. Um, so why didn't we go with Drupal? And in actual fact, I should mention that um, some of the work I'm about to describe today, um, there's been many, many attempts over the last decades to try and rationalise biodiversity systems. So biodiversity is, uh, is a mess when it comes to um, computer science. Not, not that I'm doing anything really tricky here that could be really called computer science, but just trying to structure and collate information in a, in a rational manner that is, uh, is useful to scientists without getting in their way too much. So FOSWiki has a very open community. It's a, it was important for us that we chose a platform that we could contribute to and, and, and keep our plugins alive, like as our project ends, because most of these things are project-based. They, um, they have fixed lifetimes, and people are very terrified of putting their data into a system that's going to fail or, or, or end. So we don't want to create any data jails. So investing in an open source platform helps us do that. FOSWiki has many plugins. We have um, the old TWiki project and, and FOSWiki, of course, one of the common complaints is that it's hard to search for things. And we f um, funded somebody, or at least convinced them to open source a, a, a plugin that they had written, uh, which was a solar integration. Anybody heard of solar? Yep, Lucene, natural language searching, fuzzy matching, that sort of stuff. The, the interesting thing about solar is that um, the integration for FOSWiki also does attachments and, and um, like Word documents and Excel files of all things. So if, you've, if you are plonking them and using the FOSWiki as a glorified um, file system, then you'll still be able to find those things. Um, FOSWiki also has a superbly modular architecture. Now, I wouldn't say that the code is brilliant, but the APIs are generally pretty flexible. They've been well thought ahead. And, um, you know, being Perl and such an old Perl project, there's some ugly code, but there's some pretty good code in there too. This is contrasting to TikiWiki, which is another, another platform that we 
considered, um, among other things, so apart from Drupal and TikiWiki, and TWiki and FossWiki, um, we also considered Google Wave. I actually wrote a couple of robots for Google Wave. That was a very interesting experiment that we couldn't get anyone to use. Um, there was also XWiki, which is a giant Java project. And as no one in my team is really strong in Java, we, we didn't go very far with that. So we kept coming back to FossWiki because it's very easy to hack being Perl. It's, it's designed for hackers by hackers. That does show up a little bit in the user interface, or well, I should say a lot, actually. But with, with, with proper training, and there are some plugins that make the default FossWiki a lot easier to use. One of them being that edit contrib, uh, sorry, plugin, which um, allows users to interact to, or set, set preferences on their topics a lot more easily. And we do have WozzyWig. So actually, I personally use WozzyWig quite a bit, not just for, um, not when I'm writing FossWiki code, like macro expressions and building reports, but it's very useful to paste from rich text sources. It can filter the, it can filter, but preserve formatting to a certain extent, so you can keep tables and, and, and things from Word documents. And FossWiki has a tremendous whip at aptitude, which I haven't quite found in other platforms. Um, so when I say whip at aptitude, I can put something together really, really quickly once you know the patterns. Um, that, so just as an example, I'll show you something that a user asked me, I need to make a resource directory. They had a resource directory. Um, it was in Excel. You know, they're emailing it about to each other all the time. They don't know what's changed. People accidentally paste over other people's cells. All that sort of junk. I could have said use Google Docs. Um, but then that wouldn't be using the wiki, would it? No. Actually, there, there is a great sense of wanting to preserve ownership of your information. So so owning your data is a big deal in, in science and in other, in, in other enterprises. Second. Um, and this is just a very simple data forms app. And when we say data forms app in FossWiki, this is um, a sort of a data form is a schema in a sense. Well, it's a special. A data form is actually, technically speaking, a special type of topic, and it just it just holds a wiki markup table, and all it does is describes a set of fields in terms of a key value type schema. So. I like to think of the pages on the wiki, we call them topics in FossWiki, by the way, um, as objects. And if you attach a schema to an object, it suddenly has these fields that you can populate. So this is, these are actually all pages. So we can filter these. I'm going to search for now um, so I can filter these down. So instead of a whole bunch of articles, like on Wikipedia, you could make, or sorry, MediaWiki, you could, you could make a whole bunch of these articles, an article per, per row. That's what we're usually working to, is every row in a, in a table that comes in, we turn that into a topic. But as they're all each individual pages, they have their own history. They can be separately tagged. Um, we can add multimedia to them. And we can represent each topic in a view in different ways. So if I edit this now, the schema that's defined for, for these pages have types. Um, so you can define the possible values. So this is a multi-value field, and you can sort of just keep adding to them. And then save. I won't do that because it'll make people upset. But um, Admittedly, it's, it's kind of hard for, for users to take advantage of data forms. It requires a lot of uh, reading the manual, as they say. So this is what we, we talk about when we, um, when we mention structured data. So, so if I was to ask you, what, why do you think people find Excel hard to let go of? Can you involve? Sorry? It's easy, familiar. Yep. Commonality, familiarity, and they, they think they know how it works. Yeah. 
it is definitely ownership. Ownership is what we found was the number one thing. Because we, we have many database systems developed over the years where you know, they, we're trying to take people away from using Excel. They need a collaborative um, environment. So we're trying to make them collaborate. We're trying to make the information that they create reusable and, and to, to, so that it's not sort of a throwaway thing. Throwaway thing. Um, and we're, it's frustrating watching people spend so much time fiddling and, and merging data and keeping things up to date by hand. It should be something that computers can do for them if only they would use the database that we give them. But the problem is they want to present the data in their own way. They want their columns, their headings. They want to create their own reports. They don't want to have to go through a database administrator. And that's if, if you're not a very well, if, if you don't have the resources to have, you know, the appropriate quantity of people or, or people with sufficient time and patience to sit down with users and, and work with them every day, they feel that they lose control of their data. If they keep it in their spreadsheet, yes, it wastes a lot of time, but at least it's, it's their time and, they can, and it's, it's up to them, really. So what are the risks? If we give them the perfect system, well, sometimes new systems are created, and they are technically better, but as with any project-based activity, people come and go, money comes and goes, the systems can be left neglected for years and years before the next round of funding comes through or it breaks completely. So it, it, people have experience with this where they've used a system for a while and it becomes just another jail for their data and they find it very difficult to mobilise their data in and out. Um, the other problem is it can be quite expensive to add flexibility and, and richness to the... Um, and when I say richness, I typically mean multimedia. So um, things we take for granted on a wiki, like a commenting system or image galleries and, uh, and that type of thing. And, and incidentally, we also have a, um, a web dev interface, which, which makes that quite easy to work with. Um, it can be that the new way doesn't actually meet their needs. So, has anybody heard of Google Data Wiki? No, it was a Google Labs thing. Um, it fascinates me because I read, I read the project description and it was basically describing FossWiki. Of course, they're describing their own product that they're, that they're making. Um, but it actually, they actually do a better job of describing FossWiki than FossWiki does itself. Um, Possibly because FOSWIKI is a thing that really has evolved. It, like, it, it, it never started off with all of these features and goals in mind. But as all the Perl hackers slowly you know, formulated this thing, this, this, this pattern has emerged where we can really make some really powerful stuff. So as I said, it's a key value-based schema. Um, unfortunately, there's only one schema at a time on a topic, although there are workarounds to that, but they're very geeky. Uh, model view control separation, absolutely not. That would make things difficult uh, for a user anyway. So there is a bit of, um, a bit of tie in there with, with some of the peculiar ways that we, 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 we mix up the, the view logic and the data storage. Um, plugins may extend the topic object with additional mesh, and I've used this quite effectively at work. Um, the, some of the interesting things we're doing is, is we have these web services. So people are often copy-pasting fields from external data sources, and I really just want to link to them and really just pull in that information and cache it onto the page and make it so that they don't have to maintain that stuff that they've been copy-pasting. So we can build links in. So I've got some plugins that register some new metadata types that sort of augment, augment their pages with, with external information. So we can search, sort, and report on, on metadata on topics. There is a little bit of normalization possible, and I do this a little bit, but if you really go overboard and make third normal form sort of structures, it becomes not only really, really slow, but the, the, because FOSWIC is really designed as more of a key value type query language, it, it has its own query language. Um, it, uh, it lends itself more to the denormalized sort of way of thinking. And so this is really a NoSQL approach uh, before it was called NoSQL. So this has been, before that fad sort of took off, you know, foswick has been working with this kind of data model. And in doing so, it actually has a store API, which um, allows us to drop in. So at the moment, it's actually flat text files. There's no database. 
even though we're trying to use FOSWiki as a database, FOSWiki itself, out of the box, does not use a database. It uses text files and grep. And that sounds terrifying um, and hopelessly unscalable. But if you do actually keep all your data in RAM, it works, it works surprisingly well. We've found that on virtual machines, the limit is about, well, on our virtual machines anyway, once you get to over 4,000 topics in a web, it starts to get slow. And if you have lots of concurrent users using an application in a web of that size, sorry, when I say web, I mean like a namespace and other, in other things, other work, like workspaces in, in Confluence. Um, so I don't know if you can see that, but um, so the anatomy of a topic is really what I wanted to show. When I say key value pairs, they're not necessarily key value as such. It's more of a, we have sort of root element metadata types. And each root element can have uh, a collection of key value pairs, which probably makes no sense at this time. But you just have to, just have to remember that um, we have different types of metadata. So we have user-defined metadata. We have plugin-defined metadata. And some metadata types, such as the authoring information, are native to FOSWiki itself. So they're always there out of the box. And this little diagram over here is, um, is talking about um, an instance of a topic that uses a data form. You can implement a view using a view template. And we did all of these things are pages. And that's really a fascinating thing about FOSWiki is that developing these applications and dashboards, you're just editing wiki topics. You've got your version control. You can revert. You can see who's done what um, on the application code as well. So I very rarely have to write much Perl when I'm augmenting the wiki. And just it, it, it really is great that because I'm the only system administrator. Well, I share some responsibilities with some of my colleagues. but. It's really liberating for me, as well as them, that they can actually write their own dashboards and reports without me having to be involved. So this is one report for a project we're working with, which I'll talk about a bit later. Um, and I didn't have any hand in this at all. I did a little bit of debugging. So this is showing a report of some topics that we're calling terms. Um, there's a hierarchy there. And these are all just built using standard macros, standard query expressions. It's certainly taken them, you know, probably, probably after, or after a year of usage, you can, you can do this sort of stuff. But if it's something that they're using every day, the, the reporting aspect is quite powerful for them. And it means I don't have to do much. Well, I have to do less anyway. So the weaknesses are. Your typical data entry person or person authoring content doesn't really even know what a schema is um, or what a key value thing is. So they think in terms of headings and bullets, um, things that they'll put into a Word document. Um, obviously, the more advanced users, well, when I say more advanced, so I'm talking about um, we often have students contributing to data entry efforts um, as well as researchers and volunteers, in fact. So we have community people coming in and trying to give us data about natural, um, natural science stuff. So data forms are simple, but you still have to read the manual. Um, a lot of reading the manual, if you want to do fancy queries and macros, we can do more. So now you're just going to talk about where I work a little bit. Um, that's the team. Sadly, most of these people have day jobs. So three of us work full time for Hubris. Um, until very recently, we got two extra. So we are the bioinformatics team within TRIN, something called the Taxonomic Research Information Network. Um, and the goal of TRIN is to accelerate the capture and delivery of biodiversity data. Um, and when it comes to taxonomists, they're sort of becoming less and less of them. And having them spend all day in front of spreadsheets is a waste of their time. So, so one of the things that we're trying to do with TRIN, so apart from FOSWiki, we do, other use, we do use other platforms. Um, we use a Ruby on Rails project called MX. We use um, some proprietary software that uh, makes building identification keys a lot easier. We could have done all these things in FOSWiki, but really it's all about the right tool for the job. So it's not that we're you know, obsessed with FOSWiki. It, just, it is difficult to find another open source wiki type system that has all this type of um, wiki pattern stuff to it. Um, the other thing we do at Hubris is we're trying to build a sort of uh, information best practice guide for marking up 
um, a particular type of data set, and this is taxon profiles. So these are like species pages, fact sheets, um, the type of information you might see in a field guide. If you don't know what a field guide is, that's something you take into the field with you too. So you can, if you see a critter, you can look it up and see what it is. So the thing about standards are that there's just so many of them. And when it comes to biodiversity informatics, it's no exception. So it's very daunting for your average database administrator, for someone who's not even using a wiki. So maybe they are using a corporate database uh, at a museum or, or a specimen collection. If they want to expose the data and make it reusable, even to start with, they have to know how to export the data in a standards compliant way. Because there are so many standards, it, it's difficult to know the best way to do that. So part of our project is to come up with some guidelines for that. So we're trying to avoid creating any new vocabularies, too many new terms or any new schemas. It's been necessary in a few spots, but we've done a pretty good job of um, mashing some stuff up. I'll show you that in a second. So we have this problem where we're trying to integrate many, many systems. Um, and because there's only been three of us for, for a while now, um, we've sort of tried to consolidate on just FOSWiki as a sort of portal for doing that. Um, there are, of course, lots of legacy systems. We have um, electronic lab book things. We have um, obscure specimen tracking systems. Um, and we have taxon profiles. So we're trying to only build missing bits and otherwise work on the links between systems. So rather than reinvent the world, even if we could do it in FOSWiki, we're just trying to link stuff together. So this was what I was talking before about copy-paste madness. Um, we, we have these people building species lists, checklists, and you know they're going to a database. They know the species name, but then they want all the other information associated with that name. It's classification, the authority who determined it, maybe some identification characters that comes with it. And they're sort of decorating that information with more information of their own. So that might be genetic sequences, GATC letters, that sort of stuff. And we don't want them to waste time having to keep that in sync. And it is a big problem because taxonomy changes. Sometimes, um, in this case here, I've got one highlighted right here. In, at, the, at the beginning of the year, they were looking at this species here, Rhizophora, um, Corniculata, and they've, several months later, it was, it was shifted entirely to a different order. Um, and that's cool if you know about it. But when you've got a list of a thousand species, you then, at the end of a at the end of a data collection, data collection um, effort, have to go through one by one for each one of the thousand species and look up, is it still a current name? Is it still the current classification? Is, is the authority that I've used correct or even spelt correctly? So luckily for us, this isn't true of all disciplines, but luckily for us, for plants and um, now for animals as well to a certain extent, plants are, plants are pretty robust. We have these web services that um, we can look up the name of a taxon um, and get all of that metadata about it, including its classification. Now, I'm, I'm using this word taxon profiles a lot. It's, it's occurred to me I haven't really explained what that is. So here's an example of one. Here's another example. So this is really just whenever you've got a species and any information about it. Some people have a more strict definition, but we've had to look at so many, it's sort of become all very blurry. So distribution maps, that sort of thing. There's one on the wiki. So we've come up with all these terms, um, and there's really quite a lot of them. Um, so you've got this sort of tag cloud soup of, of, of words, and people mean different things by the same word, people mean the same thing by different words, and it's really, really difficult. When you've got these different taxon profile data sets, um, and you want to present a unified view. So say you've got a collection of species um, you know, uh, that, that came from a project who, from somebody who was documenting the plants in, in, in northern Queensland, and uh, somebody's doing a mangroves project over on the east coast on some island somewhere. They're, they're talking about critters and, and species that are common between both sites, but they're talking about them with different terminology. They're using profiles that are structured slightly differently, and it's hard to present a unified view of this data. And to make it, um, it would be very, very valuable to present this data in a way that can be reused. 
So this is the problem. So this is just two different profiles, and as you can see, the mappings are not clear. There's no one-to-one -one mapping. Um, the mappings are fuzzy, where there are mappings. So our solution is to use something called, that we've called Wallace Core. This is named after, um, well, inspired by the Darwin Core standard. I don't suppose anybody here has heard of Darwin Core. Yep, one person. That's one more than I thought. Um, so Wallace Core isn't uh, necessarily inventing a whole bunch of new terminology or, or an ontology. We're using a evidence-based methodical procedure. So we've collected um, over 1,200 terms from uh, about 60, I think, taxon profiles. And we've, we've come up with a method where we're documenting the meaning and mapping of all of the elements in a taxon profile, trying to use an evidence-based approach to build a reasonably standard, there's no such thing as a standard, but we're just trying to aim for 80 to 90 percent coverage for the terms that you would expect to be able to find in a profile. And we're calling that Wallace Core. So this is, the this is what we're calling a term. Um, this is all pretty boring stuff, but the term has a label, an author, we have a basis term. So we, never, we try to never create a term out of thin air. It has to come from at least a profile that we've seen or an existing data standard that we've looked at. So we're really trying hard not to invent too much stuff from thin air. So the benefits of this approach is that, um, as I was saying, we can repurpose data a lot more easily. And I'll just show you in a second an example of that. Makes curating the data easily uh, a lot more easier. So when we have taxon profiles encoded in the wiki using the Wallace Core format, we're hoping that we avoid the data jail problem to a certain extent. Because if you can export the profile information that we've built up in the wiki, um, and take that somewhere else. That's really been the whole goal of our project. So um, we've actually had users creating their own terms. So we have a taxon profile builder toolkit, which I've worked very hard to try have ready for release for this conference, but um, didn't quite get there. So hopefully in the next week or two, that'll be available on fosswiki.org slash extensions. And this is a thing that allows users to um, create their own heading. So the thing is that they don't want to be told exactly the terminology that they have to use, because if we do that, they won't use it. This is going to be just like every other system that was inflexible that they had to use before, and they'd rather go back to Word. Um, but in order to make that workable, when they create their own term for their own profiles, we have to be able to map it back to Wallace Core. So the idea is that we have all these mappings back to Wallace Core. So in Wallace Core, we have this thing called distribution. And in this profile over here, they've called it geographical range and dispersal. In this one here, they've called it distribution. And uh, in Pliny and Core, I believe that is, they've called it endemicity. I'm just a programmer. I'm not sure if I said that right. Um, and in Weeds, they call it distribution. So this is an example of a Wallace Core term that has mappings to various other profiles. So this system basically forces the user to not only create a heading, that we like to present them as headings because that's just the easiest thing that they can cling on to, um, the easiest metaphor. But in actual fact, they are their own topic. So, so the heading in their namespace is their own topic. And the, the workflow forces them to, to um, set up a, a meaning, so a semantic definition that allows our knowledge experts, or should I say Wallace Core mappers, our mapping team, to be able to go to a user heading that somebody has created without any intervention from the wiki team to go back and sort of tidy up after them and sort of you know, um, determine what they mean when they say this heading here. Because the, the workflow forces them to, to define what they mean by that content holder. And here's an example of a term being entered. That's a very boring one. We have this thing called happiness index as well. Happiness index is how happy we are, basically, with the definition. There's also happiness index for, um, for terms. So I can sort our terms here by happiness index. Let's see how happy we are in general. So there's a few sevens there. It's um, on a scale of 1 to 9. So our first 20 results out of 1,142 are all above 5. 
but it drops off after that, I can tell you. So we're still working through those. So have I convinced anyone that a wiki could be a database? Yeah? Maybe? Yes, and uh, we are actually working on a, on a um, we're trying to adapt this system for, for a laboratory workflow that is, that is doing um, Acacia DNA. So uh, it's not been entirely smooth. We've, um, we're funding a MongoDB backend um, to make that data more scalable. So we're still making the primary data the text file because we trust text files, and that's actually one of the selling points of FOSWiki is that if it doesn't matter how hard it crashes, you've still got the text files to re resort back to. Whereas, um, you know, even, even a good SQL database can crash nastily. Um, and when it comes to MongoDB, it, well, there was a talk the other day about how hard that can crash. I don't know if you saw that one. Um, so it's really just a cache, but it, it allows us to really index the data. And, and, and the, the great thing about FOSWiki is with these store implementations, they, um, it's transparent to the user. So the user doesn't see any change. So if we swap out swap out the regex search with the MongoDB one, nothing changes for them. It just becomes faster. Um, and with the modularity of FOSWiki, um, it's, it's sort of hard to describe. Like in other, in other platforms, you don't have such a, you know, if you're going to do hardcore queries, it just exposes you to the underlying SQL database. In FOSWiki, because there is no SQL database, it has its own, it has its own query um, language. And a recent feature that was implemented was actually the ability to query all versions of all topics. So we can now search for, find me all versions of a topic that ever had a field that contained this, or that ever had you know, a, a state set to something or other, or, or ever had this list of contributors to a topic. So we're trying to improve the dashboards that we have so that a manager can look at um, the laboratory workflow and look at the things that a certain staff member has worked on in the last week, for example. And you would do that with a versions query. So the latest version might not have their authorship on it, but it will have at some point in the past. And the interesting thing about that feature was that I intended to implement it, but I made the proposal and somebody else did it for me. So that's the beauty of open source. I have to do, I have to do less. Somebody else can fix the bugs sometimes. So are there any questions? Um, MongoDB just released a new version like yesterday or something that's supposed to make it a little bit more resilient if it crashes. They've implemented a write ahead log. I don't know, just thought you might Oh, okay. Know. I, didn't, I didn't follow that. Yeah, just yesterday. Cool. Um, sorry, just another question. Um, um, one of the problems we've bumped into with trying to do data sharing initiatives in science is that people sort of get very, this is my data, I don't want to share it with him. Quite like to see your data, but I don't really want it to go the other way. Um, do you have a lot of problems with this, or is your, um, you don't have that problem at all? Well, um, I have to admit that the projects I'm working with are funded m across institutions. So there isn't such a secret um, obsession, although we do have some other we do have some other stuff that is quite private. FOSWiki implements hierarchical access controls. So you can pick and choose how you want to expose your data quite, to a quite fine detail. Um, a, couple, a quick question and a slight long question. Uh, with, with the uh, data attributes, is there some form of the wiki markup then that lets you put them into each page so you create, the page becomes a template for the metadata? So you want to pre-populate some of the metadata? No, no. I mean, like, just in the, when you look at the wiki page, rather than looking at it as a form, is it possible to have it as HTML markup where this particular wiki tag that you use to display the specific key, um, the fields? Like, so it looks more like some kind of web page rather than a form. So uh, pre-formatted. Yes. So are you familiar with <laughs> Semantic Media Wiki? Not really, no. Not really? Uh, so it sounds to me you're describing Semantic MediaWiki has these things called semantic links. So you, you can arbitrarily put any ad hoc information into the, into the page that can create metadata as, um, in a way that's unstructured or is not 
you know, bound to a schema. So is this sort of what you're talking about? Oh uh, no, no. What I'm asking is like you know when you had you clicked on like a particular pages. Um, so this is a this is a row and a table here. Come on, so Telstra. When, when you were showing like a pages field value pair, like as a form that you like, you know, selected that one. Yep. So some of the multi-select, some of them are text fields. Yes, yes. Um, can you? Like yeah, in that, but then can you say you want to put um, I, don't, I don't know, say the acronym field inside the text on the text tab? Can, can, is there oh, a, yeah. is there a markup to say put the text the acronym field here, put the biome field here? Yes. Well. Well, there is forms plugin, for example. Yes. Do you want to make it editable as well? Or no, just, no, 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 just, just displayed. Well, just displayed. there's a few different ways, sadly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's always. <laughs> this, this, is the, this is the cool new way. Um, so you just sort of do that. There's, there's, another, there's another one that's um, form field. And I could, <laughs> no? We're deprecating that one, yeah. Um, <laughs> Query is the way to do it, but if it's if it's the, the, the thing about the form types is that they can be rich for rich, rich fields, so not just holding text, um, but they can be interactive elements. So it might be Google, a Google Maps field or or a genome browser thing. So you can do so. My, a guy called Michael Dorn made um, FlexForm plugin, so I can do render for display, uh, and I forget the exact parameter, but it's something like field equals. Acronym, something like that. And if it's if it's a special field type, it'll render the JavaScript and everything necessary to make that interactive element come up. Um, could you show us an example of how you could construct a slightly complex query, like maybe sure. on a couple of fields? And uh, I also wanted to ask about um, the licensing for it because I see it's kind of like copyright respective contributors, which is not super useful in you know, a wiki, but probably you have uh, restrictions because of where the data is coming from, I'm guessing? Yes. Um, so you're talking about the content of the actual page rather than the licensing of the wiki itself? Yeah, Tring wikis, copyright. Yes. Um, a lot of it's user-created data and they haven't decided what license. So we're trying to push them to use Creative Commons, but uh, they sort of, they want to share it, but they don't you know, asking them about a license is really too hard. And you know, I've got this. I've got this guy. He's made this um, Latin glossary. It's the most comprehensive botanical Latin glossary you could have. And we're almost at the point where we can release it to the public. It's better than the Google Latin um, translator, by the way. I don't know if you've actually tried to use it for scientific Latin, but it's not very good. Um, and the glossary isn't by any means uh, as interactive as the Google Latin thing, but. Um, it's a very comprehensive list of 25,000 glossary terms. It covers um, some Greek as well. Um, and the problem is, he wants to share the data, but he doesn't, and he wants to have credit, but he doesn't want to be credited when somebody's changed it. And I haven't really found a CC license that sort of covers that scenario. If you can help me, I'd, I'd be glad to hear it. But um, I've nearly, I've nearly convinced him. So let's see if I can do a live demo. So FOSWiki macros are interesting. In, in, in other platforms, you, um, you sort of have this um, outside in expansion order. In FOSWIC, it's inside out. So you can actually build compositions of macros. So like you can build an inner macro that expands first, then an outer macro that takes the output of that one. And you can feed macros into other ones and build these monstrosities. So I go search, type. So I, I'm going to say um, I want to get all my term forms. This is a query search.
running an experimental version of Mongo, so I don't, whoops, missing operator. That's because there's no operator. Now, this is, this is running in debug mode on my laptop, so this might take a while. I think this is 1400. If you go to Web Search Advanced, um, when you hit it, return, get your results down the bottom, it even tells you what you'd put into the topic if you wanted to make a topic with that. Um, so it's kind of a, a, a semi useful uh, prototyping tool that most people don't know about. I knew about it, but I haven't used it. A <coughs> uh, bit of change of tech. Have you thought about um, the kinds of things that HTML5 will allow you to do with this sort of system? Um, hopefully. Um, if we do HTML5, I'll be able to become WCAG compliant as well. Um, sorry, that's on the top of my list. <laughs> um, HTML5, yes, it will, at the moment, FOSSWiki is not very Ajaxy. So every, every sort of screen is its own request. It would be nice to have, um, you know, like a, a, a sort of a page that you don't leave, but it's going to reload those divs and, and do all those Ajax kind of things. And we've sponsored a, a REST plugin because the native REST API is a bit lacking. Um, but the new REST plugin allows us to um, uh, at, uh, send, send objects in JSON to and from the server over HTTP REST with content negotiation. So that's the first step to really enabling Ajaxy type stuff. Um, but in, in terms of specific HTML5 technologies, I haven't really thought that far ahead. We're getting close to the end, so I'll just take one more question. I uh, like the idea of um, uh, sort of bottom-up. You can design a form out of nothing and your users can when they need it. Can you add how simple is it to add constraints, validation, this one's got to be a number, anything like that, when that was your starting point, somebody just said, here's a box? Yes, validation is something that um, can be done but isn't part of the native uh, data forms experience. Yeah, it's 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 on the it's it's an intended feature yet to come. So, um, so really, it, it it's hard to enforce constraints and things because fundamentally a topic is just a collection of yep. metadata. So uh, there's nothing nothing that I know of. You, you could make a plugin that prevents somebody saving illegal values into a into a metadata field if you so wish to do it that way. But you're sort of then short circuiting a lot of the arbitrary. Excel-like nature of, of this information. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, I think uh, Paul's going to be around for a few more uh, minutes after the talk, uh, but we have to get ready for uh, the next one. So uh, it's been good to hear how uh, trying to deal with uh, the unreasonable demands of all those users out there leads to uh, these interesting bits of software. So would you all join with me in thanking Paul? Thank you.